Okay, this is the uh, second half of the second second half of the lecture on the second day. Uh, I just wanted to make a few more comments about the overall layout here uh, before we went on, because I'm going to be talking about some of the cells, some of the other cells uh, that were used in the OM2 data path chip, that, which was designed at Caltech. The uh, Dick has already talked about this register array, and besides that, there are two other interesting array structures. Uh, involved in the in the data path, there's a barrel shifter right here, and then there's an ALU right here. And uh, just to orient you as far as what the rest of the what the rest of the chip really is, uh, this is basically just a lot of PLA decoding uh, for all the control lines that go across the chip, and the same on the other side with rows of drivers uh, in between to uh, allow it to drive the long lines involved in uh, in the chip. And along the edges are, of course, uh, the, the pads, input and output pads. And, and that's about it. So when we get done, we will have looked at uh, the structures in, in just about all of this uh, processor chip. Yeah, take this one. <clears throat> uh, just looking at the ALU section a little more in detail, uh, there's actually uh, two classes of interesting things about this ALU. Number one, how, how it was sort of logically implemented, uh, and that's a topic in itself, and then there's how the, how the logic was implemented in NMOS, and that's the topic that I'm going to spend most of my time on. There are three functional blocks uh, involved in the unit right here, right here, and on the output there. There's an input register uh, to, to latch an input uh, a pair of input signals right here with uh, an inverter here, an inverter here, and a feedback path uh, here, all uh, controlled by uh, a couple of clock lines. To further uh, clarify uh, sort of the running of, of, of uh, the different layers on this chip, you'll notice that both power and ground and the control lines are all run in metal vertically across the chip. This is extremely important in a, in a chip such as this where you want uh, maximum speed. Uh, the ability to be able to run the, all the control lines as well as the power lines in metal is a, is a significant advantage in that regard. And so the, it, only the data is flowing across horizontally. And the places where you need control lines turn to transistors, you'll notice uh, little tabs that come out. For instance, here's a, a clock line here, and it has these the tabs of the transistor gates or the poly layer here that control the, the green layer. And the same sort of thing exists here in these areas right here and other places across the chip. Go ahead. Just uh, reviewing quickly the functional block, the, uh, this is obviously very similar to the one, or the, the same as what we've been looking at for the last day and a half. Uh, I just wanted to make sure that everybody understood that, that these lines are, let me point them out up here, these lines are all uh, con uh, output lines from the microcontroller word and determine the function of each particular function block at a particular time. And for example, in the next slide. Yellow is the yellow transistor, the implant, uh, disregard. Uh, it's a, it's a depletion mode, always on transistor. It's a no-op, right. <clears throat> and as I, as I noted, the sort of principal points about this, well, let me, no, let me ignore that for the moment. Will you move it up to the top so I can point it out? The, uh, here I, I drew a, um, what, what the control lines would be to implement the exclusive NOR function which is essentially what, what Dick showed this morning. He had the same sort of structure, but being driven by explicit uh, uh, inverter gates or explicit signals to implement that one function. Here, we're driving it with, with, uh, with alterable control bits to get various functions. And to get the control, to, or to get the exclusive OR function, you make G1 and G2 low, and G0 and G3 high. And what comes out on this output line is the exclusive NOR of of the A and B input signals. Now could you no, move it down, because now I want to talk about the clock logic thing. OK, so 
Uh, one of the tricks which they they played in, in trying to speed up this particular kind of logic in the OM2, and in fact it's a fairly common technique, and that is of, of pre-charging. And we haven't talked about this in the past, and it is uh, important, and so I wanted to bring it up at this time. You can uh, drive these lines with either positive or, or, or high or low signals and allow those high and low signals to propagate through these, dif these diffusion or green paths to uh, or together at this point and implement a particular function. But, uh, and with no, with no pull up on, on this particular line. But as we discovered uh, yesterday, uh, generating high going signals is generally the slowest of your two alternatives. You'd much rather be propagating and or generating low going signals. And so they take advantage of, of the fact that uh, low signals in general can be generated and propagated faster in this particular structure by, uh, by pre-charging this, this line right here, or the output line, and always driving these, these input lines with low signals for the particular function which they want to perform. And so they never try to propagate uh, high signals through this structure. And with the two-phase clock, you can do the operation on one cycle and pre-charge the, the bus or uh, whatever other structure uh, that you need to pre-charge. Generally, it's a bus that you're pre-charging. You can do that pre-charging on the, on the other phase of the cycle. And for example, there are a lot of the, all the data paths in the OM chip are pre-charged on one of the cycles, and, and all the operations take place in general on, on the other cycle. And that is carried through all the way down to the uh, function block level. Now, what is a pre-charging uh, signal, and, and uh, what advantage does it get you? Well, number one, it's, a, it's an enhancement mode load. It's a device which just looks like this. This is VDD. It got smeared away. And it's driven, in general, by a, a fa one of the phases of the clock line, in this case, phase one. And as we remember, a, a an enhancement mode device, such as this one, does not make as good of load device as a depletion mode device. Number one, it isn't always on. And number two, uh, it doesn't pull up all the way to VDD. If this input goes high, the highest, this being really a pass transistor, the highest that this point can get is VDD minus one threshold, because as soon as this line gets to within one threshold of VDD, the transistor is going to turn off. And so uh, these, out, these lines, which are precharged, will never get to VDD, but nevertheless, they get to a high enough logic level to make it uh, advantageous and, and interesting to, to do the things this way. The other advantages are associated with this, as I said before, you can increase the speed because you're, you're pre-charging or you're, you're driving, high the lines, driving the lines high when you might not have been doing anything else since the operations take place on the other, other half cycle. And also, there's no DC power dissipation. If, this were, uh, if you had standard pull-ups, you'd not only have to sync all that current in whether the, whether the syncing transistors were on or off, but you'd also have to well, the, the point is the depletion mode transistors are always on, so you always have to put that power someplace. In, in this case, you only turn these on to pre-charge the line, and as soon as the line is pre-charged, uh, this transistor cuts off and it draws, draws no more power. And so it is, in fact, a lower power technique and uh, in contributes to increased speed. Are there any questions on that? Lots of questions. Uh, Lots of. You might want to talk about the clocking of A and B, uh, so as uh, not to get into troubles with charge sharing. The well, the the thing which is done is these lines are also precharged, are also held high during that time, and and so there's there's no there's nowhere for for the current to go. Well, you could have an isolated node between A prime and B prime, for example, of uh, a, a, a little pile of green that's, that's insulated. Uh, that has a different oh, between, voltage. Yeah. In between these, I think you have that problem. I mean, no matter what set of inputs you have here, uh, you have that, that problem, right? I mean, you can't do anything with those inputs to eliminate that problem. Well, if you clock, for example, A and B on phase one. You mean if you take all these lines high? No, no, no. Okay. You make, you make sure that they have the right value during phase one and that they don't change after that. You have a latch to the left. Yes. It's clocked on phase one. But the latch has a, I mean, 
you don't know what the data is that's coming in here, and you can't. The you, say, have the data you understand what the cycle earlier. Well, yeah, I think when it says the data stabilizes during phase one, mm -hmm. then those isolated nodes will never be unisolated. Will never cause any charge share. In other words, it's a non-problem. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Perhaps we can talk about it later. I don't know what the... The main thing that I wanted uh, to come out was that when you, when you do pre-charging, uh, there's, there's something called charge sharing you at least have to think about. You mean between, in these isolated nodes in here? Yeah. In, in, in various Anywhere. places, depending upon how you do your design, uh, that, that once you cut off the... the uh, uh, the, the enhancement mode load there. Mm -hmm. uh, then there's no. Then the, you have to worry you have about, to worry, where, where about where all that charge can that's go. That's right. There's only. That's right. You've got to make sure that that there isn't some way that you can sort of cut this charge in half so that it reaches some intermediate value by uh, maybe one of these turning on and but not and and having to pump some charge in here. Well, let's pick another example. This one turning on later and 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 pumping some charge into the straight capacitance here and reducing the voltage here. And part of that is to make sure that this capacitance is much bigger than, than whatever it might have, the other straight capacitances which it might have to charge up uh, when, when the inputs change. Right, okay. So the output of this function is, is driven entirely by the capacitance of the circuit there, right? Uh, that's correct. And so you've got to make sure that uh, after you pre-charge this thing and you go to the next cycle when you're going to try to use the data, that it can't dribble away someplace. And, and decrease the, the voltage level on this to some intermediate value which would leave you in an undefined state. How do you choose an appropriate value of K for that sort of a setup? I would assume it would be much smaller than Well, there, there is no, I mean, there, there's sort of a K of capacitance instead of a K of yeah, resistance. Right. <laughs> and, and that's, uh, you just have to analyze what the, what the capacitances are associated with uh, with the line that you're pre-charging and, and the capacitance is associated with circuits that may become uh, chargeable a a on the other cycle when you're trying to make use of that pre-charge line. So and in, in some cases, you can, you can convince yourself that, well, there's really, not, there's really not any chance of a significant drop in this voltage because there isn't very much straight capacitance that might have to be charged up. If there, uh, and I can't give you a general rule of thumb. I mean, you just have to be careful about that and be aware of it and analyze the cases that are, that are particularly uh, touchy. And, and if you have touchy cases, maybe you decide that you don't want to do it that way. You play it safe and, and uh, bite it and, and pump it a little more power or something like that. In that picture, those, uh, those squares meant to be on the green wire instead of the blue? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, <laughs> those squares. I started out, did it wrong here. I corrected myself there, but I got off by the time I was the part of the right. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah, a little drift. <laughs> okay, this is uh, just a, a block diagram of the ALU. Remember, there was a there was a latch out here. There's two function blocks which. Uh, control the propagation and killing of the carry signal. The carry signal is propagated up through a, a logic chain, which we'll look at in a moment. And then there's a result register, or a result function block over here, which looks at the, the carry and the propagate, or the carry and the kill, sig carry and propagate signals, I think it is, and, and generates an output based on, on those two inputs. Uh, this is just to give you an overall view of a 4x4 four four slice of the ALU. And uh, why don't we look at it in more detail on the next slide. Okay, here you get a little better view of how the pre-charging is actually uh, done in the, uh, in the ALU section. Not only are the function block pull-ups uh, pre-charged, but you'll also notice that there's a, a carry, the carry line here is also gated onto the, the pre-charge, or is also pre-charged to make it so that you only have to propagate a zero carry rather than a, rather than arbitrary one or zero depending on what stage you're in, at and what it happened to have been left at as a result of the previous operation. So let's just look at that. The, the pre-charge is really uh, just one of the, the phases of the clock. And what it does is it comes up here and it turns on an enhancement mode device here. And this is connected to VDD right here. 
And so you get this, this carry line here pre-charged, and at the same time, uh, the pre-charge line is, is connected to uh, basically the, an ORD with the output of the function block to make sure that, that this carry kill, this is a carry kill uh, transistor, which will pull the carry to ground if that's the desired function. But that has to be turned off when you turn on the pre-charge, otherwise uh, you'll get some funny intermediate voltage here. And so you have to make sure that all the things, when you're pre-charging, you have to make sure that all the things might, that might pull that line down are clocked off at the same time. Otherwise, uh, you'll get worse than charge sharing. You won't even get a chance to, you won't even get that far. Uh, the same thing uh, happens down here. And just as uh, a sidelight of how this, the carry chain was uh, implemented, it was mainly implemented with, with pass transistors where you take the, the current state of this, the, the stage at which the, the carry is at and you decide whether to propagate it or whether to kill it depending on these two or that transistor and, and this pass transistor. But as we see, if, this is a 16-bit wide ALU and you don't want to send that carry signal through 16 uh, pass transistors uh, without restoring the level uh, because it gets terribly slow. And so what they did was they, they made a standard cell uh, which had two inverters out here, which they needed anyway to generate the, the true complement of the carry. And they made a, a, a sort of a programmable c connection here. And every fourth one, they made the connection to the output of, of this guy over here rather than directly from the carry-in. So the carry-in was routed through here, uh, inverted twice and buffered, and routed back into the carry chain. So all the cells have this, this extra thing here, and they only program the particular ones to uh, put in uh, this uh, to decide which way to do it. Uh, I guess that's all I really want to say from that drawing. Questions? Yeah. Why, on the, the output inverter of that guy, why is the gate of the load good? The oh, never mind. I understand. <laughs> <laughs> okay, where are we going? Okay, this is a... Uh, that's all I was going to say about the ALU. I really wanted to emphasize the, the, uh, the way the pre-charging is done and the way the programmable carry was done and so forth. Bob? If you, if you have those inverters there anyway, what's the disadvantage of just doing it every time? It takes longer. It takes longer? There's, yeah, it, take it takes longer, longer to go through those two inverters than to go through a pass transistor. So you always go through the pass transistor unless you've sort of gone through four already, then you go through the inverter. And there's a trade-off. You know, it's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, uh, a minimum where, you, and it's been found that approximately uh, every, well, it's actually, I guess, one every 2.7 pass transistors, but they made, a, they made a compromise. About every four pass transistors, uh, they decided that it was best to route it through that extra delay of the inverter structure. What's, and what's the relationship between this time that you're talking about and the clock? All the, the, the carry propagation has to happen in one clock cycle, or in one phase of the, of the clock cycle. And so you have to make that, the, the length of the, in fact, the whole length of the machine cycle is detem determined by how long it takes that carry to propagate up that path. So it is the determining factor in how fast the machine runs. <clears throat> okay, uh, we've just been talking about the ALU section here. Dick has talked about the, the memory. And there's one other quite interesting structure in this, uh, in this system, which is this barrel shifter array. And uh, it's interesting from several points of view. And uh, let me just to make sure that everybody understands what, what it exactly is that we're talking about before we look at the details of it. The, they really have uh, two buses that are running all the way across the chip, or in fact, 32 bit, 32 parallel bits, which they can choose 16 bits that they want to operate from or look at at any particular time. And so what the barrel shifter does is it gives them an opportunity to look at any subset of 16 bits uh, of those 32 bits, depending on what the shift constant is. The shift constant can go from 0 to 15, and you can, and you can look at any of those bits. Now, another way of looking at it is you'd say, well, it's really just a shifter because it just takes these, these bits and, and shifts them down one or two or three or four and so forth, or as a matter all the way up to 15. 
and uh, you can do any one of those shifts in, in one clock cycle, as we'll, as we'll see. Now I'm going to go, I'm going to describe the details of, of how this basic structure is built. Uh, this, this barrel shifter in the OM is actually a little bit more complicated than just a barrel shifter because they used it to insert literals and uh, they've got the 32-bit wide bus and everything. But I'm going to descri describe the, the basic function of it without describing the exact details of the OM chip. So the, don't try to exactly match the slides which I'm going to show with uh, with the ones that are in the book. You can look at the ones in the book and add the extra complications and try to understand it from there. Okay, there are, uh, go ahead. The, these slides are, are disconnected and they're meant to be laid on top of each other to make a particular point and so they don't make a whole lot of sense perhaps in your drawing, but you can color in some things if it's uh, helpful. Uh, the, imp the important thing that I wanted to show by this is that the shifter array is really just wires. And by and by, they inserted a few transistors at strategic points to, to implement a function. Uh, the, the basic idea is that you've got some, some input, an input bus here, which I've shown in red, and an output bus, which is shown in green. And if you want to make the barrel shifter sort of function, uh, what that means is that you want to be able to take, for instance, bit zero and route it to any one of the other bits uh, down along the bus. And so that must mean that you need some vertical data path as well as a horizontal data path. And because it's only a one directional shift, you can, uh, you end up with a triangular sort of structure as, as I've shown here, where you might take the, the output of bit zero and want to be able to route it either to output bus zero or output bus one or bus two, three, four, and all the way down to six. And uh, if you just imagine, well, how, how would we go about doing that? You could think, well, if we had a transistor that, that linked from here to here, which, was control, which had a separate control line from one which is linked from here to here, uh, that, would, that would at least give you the, the crossbar sort of matrix or half crossbar that you needed for the function that you wanted to do. And then that would involve, you'd also have to figure out how to route the wires uh, to control those. And that's what the next slide shows. When you put that on top of it, we're going to insert those transistors and I've drawn only one of the control lines. Uh, these are, okay, this is the, th these are the shift constants. No, this is a shift constant that's going to be coming in here. I've only shown one of the shift constants. And it will allow you to take, for instance, the data on bus four, route it down here to a gate that's turned on. And if you make this input high, it will turn this gate on and route that bit onto this wire. and. Uh, and all the others would be off at the same time. Now you would draw uh, additional shift wires t for different amounts of shift by routing another one up here, up through here, up through here, and, and so forth. And uh, I just drew one, just drew one of those shift constant wires in there just to make it uh, uh, a little bit easier to see. Does it, people have questions on that particular structure? Yeah. Is there a point in keep continuing the red bus beyond uh, where it transitions to over, over here? Yeah, I noticed, let's say on three, you, continue, you start on three, and oh, you, it transitions go, to blue there, uh, uh, there about a third of the way across the slide, yeah. and then continues to the right. Um, is it up? You mean, th you're talking about this line or this line The here? red line, the, the horizontal red line labeled three. Mean yeah, uh, in this particular diagram, no, I was just making a regular thing. In the OM, they have a reason for doing it because it's running all the way across the chip. Uh, I just did it to make it similar, but but you're right. It would you could really end it would end up being sort of a triangular uh, matrix. They found a use in the OM for the other half of the triangle, and, uh, and that was for inserting the literals. And they have another bus which starts basically here and goes up, and from here and goes up and so forth. And uh, so you see a split that, that makes a, a diagonal cut across the shift array. And uh, the other important things about this a shifter that I want to point out are, A, there's no power and ground in this whole, this whole array. You have this whole array of, of crossing wires, and, there, and there's no power and ground anywhere in it, uh, which means partly you don't dissipate any power in that whole array, which means you get a very powerful function without, without having to route the wires and without having to dissipate the, the power and ground. There is, I think they do pre-charge. Let's see, do they pre-charge? They, they do pre-charge the buses, but... Uh, and so they only have to pull down through those pass transistors. Uh, the other thing is that uh, 
the, to, no matter how long the shift is, it only has to go through one pass transistor. Notice that uh, shift all the way from the top comes all the way down here on blue line, which is the best sort of possible case, and it has to make one, uh, well, let's show an example where we have one. Uh, we ha it only has to make one pass or one, one transit through a pass transistor to get to its destination. So no matter how long the shift is, uh, essentially all the shifts take the same length of time and, and go very quickly. And so it's uh, one of the finest examples of, of great power, great uh, logic power uh, with very little uh, energy and, uh, and very high speed. It's the sort of thing which you might not have ever considered designing if you were thinking in terms of gates. If you try to implement this structure, uh, I think thinking in terms of TTL, you might have rejected the idea out of hand. Yet in LSI, it's a, sort of a natural function. That's it. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about the. Uh, this is not in the OM. We've uh, we've actually covered all the major subsystem ideas in the OM, and this is another one uh, I haven't actually seen used in, a, in an actual chip, although it has some interesting aspects about it, and so I want to uh, talk about it for a minute. What we're describing here is, is a structure which is familiar to most computer scientists and electrical engineers, and that is a, uh, a push-down stack where you have some uh, some piece of memory which you can push data onto, and whenever you push a new piece of data onto this, uh, into this location, it will push everything else down. And uh, alternatively, you can pop things off. And it's also called uh, a LIFO, or last in, first out sort of stack. You can only take, put things in and take things out and from, the, from the top element. And uh, it has a particularly interesting uh, layout possibilities in LSI. And that's what we want to talk about. What I've shown here is, is one bit of, of such a structure. And you can make it uh, wider in this direction to have, uh, to have a, a multi-bit wide word, which you probably have 8 or 16 bits wide in this direction. And uh, you can make it deeper this direction, as, as deep as you want to make the stack. Uh, this, sort of brings up one of the, the constant problems in, in designing specialized structures. Uh, as, again, most of you, I, I'm sure, are familiar, when uh, almost every machine uh, that, is, that is used today has a stack in it, but it's a simulated stack and not a real hardware stack. And it generally runs out of main memory. And uh, that has the advantage that it's, uh, it's using a general purpose structure and there's a lot of it, and you don't have to decide at the time that you build it how deep do you want to make the stack. And uh, that sort of argument could, can, can and has been used about some, some uh, specialized structures such as this one. And I don't particularly want to get into that. I'm just going to say that, that you could argue for or against this. And, uh, and I just want to approach it from the uh, LSI point of view and, and how it's laid out. And you can decide whether it's useful in your particular application. Uh, it's a little bit hard to understand if you aren't familiar with or you aren't used to uh, following these clock signals around very well. So let's just go through a, a couple of, uh, of the operations. If you want to do a, if, if, if you've got a bit of data that's already stored in here, what you'd like to do is just have it remember it and not have it uh, disappear on you. And so uh, that's done merely by keeping this pass transistor and this pass transistor clocked on alternate phases of the, of the two-phase clock. In this case, the transfer right signal or transfer right gate is clocked on phase two, and transfer left is clocked on phase one. And what, what's really true is that these signals are generated by anding uh, the fact that you are not trying to push anything onto the stack and phase one in this case, uh, or in, in this case up here. And uh, this one is turned on if you aren't trying to pop anything off the stack, and it's phase two of the clock. It's important to realize that you cannot uh, turn on this one and this one at the same time. It's the same sort of problem that Dick pointed out in the beginning of the lecture, that uh, if you try to turn on two pass transistors driving a node at the same time, uh, you're going to get some ill-defined or undefined state. And so you never want to do that. And so you better, in this sort of structure, you better uh, gate the clocks such that only one can ever be on at the same time. Here we're driving it with the uh, this is driven with the push 
and phase one, and this is driven with push not and phase one, and so that uh, makes sure that they're mutually exclusive as far as being turned on. So uh, recirculating is fine, but sometimes you want to push something onto the stack, in which case during the next phase one, you would uh, turn, on the, turn on this gate. This one would not be on in that particular case. You would store the charge on this node right here. It would propagate through here, and on the next phase two, it would propagate the rest of the way around the loop. And then on the next phase one, this would turn on and keep that bit stored in, in the register. The pop is, is just the uh, opposite operation. You're trying to move data in this direction. Uh, the, this data would move off here and go to the next stage. It would come in at a place such as this, uh, gated with, with pop and phase two, and drive this node, where this one would be turned off, charge up this guy, or, or discharge it, in, as the case may be, propagate through here. And next phase one, that would be latched into this, this storage element. Any questions so far? This brings up uh, another important concept in, in LSI design, and it's something you often specifically avoid in, in a normal single clock system or when you're doing TTL design, for example. The thought of gating clocks strikes panic into uh, many people's minds and so forth. But in a two-phase clock system, it turns out not only to be uh, quite safe, but also useful and necessary. And so let's just look at that in a little more detail for a minute and uh, clarify how that works. This is a little bit different diagram than the one in the book, because I think it's easier to understand. At least it's easier for me to understand. And so that's why I drew it this way. Uh, this is merely showing how you would generate these four control signals that are driving the pass transistors on the previous, uh, on the previous bit of logic. Uh, one of the things you say, well, what's, what's this, this thing? Well, this thing is, is completely equivalent to this. And in fact, would be implemented as what we think of as a NOR gate in the logic. It's just that the function it performs is, is, more rep is better represented by this symbol, where you're looking at the AND of two low signals to produce a high output, rather than trying to think of it as the OR of two high signals to, pre to present a low output. And this is just a, a lot easier to understand and talk about when it's, it's drawn in that fashion. And uh, I've also separated the, the push and the pop uh, signals. Uh, to make the operation transfer a little bit clearer than it is in the book. Uh, you'll notice that, that here we're, we're gating with the clock. Here's, here's the, the clock signals. And we're gating with the clock the push, in this case, or the push bar, in this case, signal. And so when you have phase one not and you're not pushing, then you do the, or when push is high or this push bar is low, then you want to do a shift right, which is the push operation coming in from the top in that, in that previous diagram. And if you, are, if you are not doing a push, in other words, this is low, then uh, you want to, at, at phase one, notice these are the same clocks, at phase one you want to do the transfer right sort of thing. And uh, in order to eliminate possible race conditions and overlaps and so forth, Remember that the phase one and phase two are never true at the same time, and that you're loading what you're going to do during phase one during phase two. And so during phase one, these are, are during phase one not, in other words, when these are high, nothing's, nothing's happening, can happen out here because these two inputs are high. And at that time, you're, you're changing this node right here. So you're changing this node and changing this node. But these gates are disabled, so that it can't affect the output. On the next phase of the clock, on phase one, the, that operation is actually performed. So you load the operation on one phase of the clock and execute the operation on the second phase of the clock. And so it makes a very, uh, a very uh, predictable uh, sort of timing mechanism. And this thing of, of gating clocks uh, with control lines to actually perform some function is a, is a powerful concept. Whether you're loading, selectively loading registers, for example, or selectively doing a push or a pop, for, uh, in this case, uh, it's used. It's used quite frequently. Dave. I don't understand what you mean by gating clocks. It looks to me like that's just what you do with clocks anyway. Is that you use them to let a signal go by or not? Well, it's uh, I, it's a little bit hard to explain in the abstract. We'd have to look at some examples. Uh, you you can you mean in, in in like in TTL design, a normal design that people are most familiar with. Uh, you can uh, as, when you have a single phase clock and 
some people will try to gate those single phase clocks, but uh, you can often run into trouble in terms of race conditions and, and spikes and, and so forth, and, and it often is a source of problems. However, that is not true in this case. Well, for instance, what's, um, at the places where the, where the clock comes in, isn't, that, isn't it performing essentially the same function that it performs in other places in the circuit? This is not a gated clock, right? Yes, this is a gated clock. No, the I mean, clocks are not being gated. This is a clock, and I'm gating it through this gate. <laughs> with the control signal. I'm using a control signal to gate whether this clock goes through or not. How but it seems to be in most cases. Like, uh, I don't understand. I mean, it's infinite. If they're happy with it, I mean, you didn't want people to be shocked by it, and they're yeah. clearly nuts. <laughs> I'm saying this is not a problem. That this works fine. <laughs> yeah, the, I was just asking whether this is whether this is different than the way that clocks are normally used, because it doesn't seem to me well, that it that's, is. Well, that's, yeah, Bill. I think the difference is that typically you consider clocks as clocking storage elements. Right. In this case, you're clocking logic, which you normally don't. Well, but even when we're clocking storage elements, we gate the clock. <laughs> oh, right, but. In, in, like when we're loading a register, you either gate the data in from one source or recirculate it. And that's gated with load or load bar, basically. But, but you get away with that because you have these nice two non-overlapping phases of the clock, which is not typical of what you have in a TTL design. And I'm just, I just said that for the benefit of those who are familiar with TTL design. It, and in, in the insides of TTL chips, you'll probably find the two phases of the clocks. And they'll be gating them internally. It's just that you don't normally have to do that uh, yourself. Any, any time that you have a clock that's not applied directly to a storage element, it's called a gated clock. And that's just sort of the definition. OK. Now, yeah, I mean, here. Whatever. I mean, here we are. Here we are applying the clock to a not a storage element. We're getting, you know, we're putting it through an AND gate, and we're determining whether that clock gets propagated through, depending on a control signal. And that's that's everything and and er that I want to say about that. I guess. <laughs> it might be slightly clearer if you called it something like qualified or not qualified clock. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, people are having trouble with the term gate. I feel like. Well, I, yeah, I, I don't understand it because there's, okay, we're qualified, if that makes it clear. <laughs> what, what everybody else calls it, a gated clock. Yeah, it's a gated clock. I mean, that's yeah, it seems to me, though, that you're making a distinction of the clock, uh, of a control signal allowing the clock through as opposed to the clock allowing a control signal through. Uh, because that, that's a useful distinction, and, and I agree you could argue the other way, but it's, it's a distinction which I wish to make in this case. Okay. That's what I didn't understand. Okay. I'm sorry. I didn't realize that. Yeah, you can certainly look at either one gating the other. But in fact, the, the control signal is there before and after the clock. And so that's really the control, you know, the... Hey, now, the, wait a minute. Yeah. Now, wait a minute. The <laughs> clock is... The, the purpose of the clock is to determine when things happen in the machine. By putting it through a gate like this, you have changed the time at which something is going to change out there. Normally. You try to make everything change at the same time by doing all your conditional gating ahead of time and use tra using trailing edge triggering. That's sort of the traditional thing in TTL and ECHO and so forth. Now, what you're doing here is, in fact, changing the time at which the clocking is going to take place. Is that not right? Uh, well, there, there are two aspects of this, and, I, and I, I think I would partially disagree. And let me just talk about another aspect of, of this and see if that's partially what you're getting at. Uh, you, you got skew. You're introducing skew by this potential skew. If those gates have different times, you can no longer say with certainty that the things are going to happen at a homogeneous time out here to the right. But you don't care. Yes. Well, maybe you do and maybe you don't, but that's the thing that's different about this from the... From the well, you have clock skew problems in any system. Well, you, you, try you, to you try to reduce or eliminate them by carrying the, the raw clock around on metal to everything and doing all your gating in yeah. front of that. Okay. The, 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 the problem of clock tangles. distribution is not a trivial one. And, and it's something that you, especially on a large chip, do have to be worried about. And you can certainly easily run into clock skew problems in this system or in an ECHL system or whatever. And, and, uh, and you have to worry about it in, in both situations. And this is no exception to, the, to this clock skew problem. And certainly having to gate, you know, you want to do this, uh, you, you want to do the, do whatever is necessary to make sure that the clocks arrive as near to the same time at all elements as possible. This seems to introduce an additional problem. Because any difference between those gates is going to introduce skew under the clock, which you wouldn't have had. That's true. That's part of 
that's something you have to worry about. That's that's the answer to Dave's question. Okay. That's what's different about this. Right. Oh, okay. And so part of the clock is encoded on whether on on the control lines now. Is that? <laughs> yeah, let's forget it. I think most people understand what the basic uh, considerations are. Uh, this is raise up the top part of the thing here. I just wanted to show how the, the layout, a possible layout for this system was done. Here, uh, VDD and ground are run vertically, and again, the, the clock lines uh -huh, are run in metal. <laughs> and uh, with, with the little tabs here, and you've got the inverters sort of folded, folded towards each other to share a VDD line and, alter, and alternating ground VDD and so forth. And with the, with the recirculation elements up, up here and down here. And so you can see from this how you can easily extend the register both in this direction to get uh, depth uh, to the stack and this direction to get width on the stack. <coughs> Okay, one of the other potential uh, uses for LSI is to make what is called smart memories. And actually, the stack you can be thought of, I guess, as one example of a smart memory. It's a set of storage elements which does something other than strictly remembering what, what data that you gave to it. It actually uh, will control uh, the flow of data within itself to some extent. There are various other smart memories which you might consider building for particular applications. Uh, for example, you might want to build a memory which sorts itself uh, so that you don't have to use the processor to uh, do the sorting. Uh, you might want, want to build a memory that automatically does garbage collection for you so you don't have to spend half your processor time doing garbage collection. Uh, these are not necessarily trivial problems. These are just ones that have been mentioned. <laughs> uh, this is actually an example of one that, that uh, somebody at Caltech is working on. Uh, gen having a chip which, which stores a rectangle in terms of its coordinates, uh, and, and then you actually use the logic within the memory to generate, to decide when that rec each rectangle looks at, at where the display is in a raster scan display and decides whether it should show itself at that particular time. It knows where it is, and so each element keeps track of, of that, and, or keeps track of where you currently are in your display and decides whether to contribute his little bit of information to, uh, to the raster at that, at that particular time. And uh, so that's a potentially useful device. Uh, one of the things, uh, the w example that I'm going to talk about is a content addressable memory. And uh, this is one I've done a fair amount of messing around with. And uh, I have an example of a layout on the next, on the next page. A content addressable memory, for those of you who don't really appreciate what, the, what you might do with such a thing, is that it's a structure that uh, allows you to address it by what's actually stored in a memory location rather than having to know the address of a particular thing and, uh, and finding it that way. Like, you may have to search through a long list of addresses to find a particular item that you're looking for. And wouldn't it be nice if you could just give some information about that item and get, and what was returned to you was all the other pieces and uh, bits or information associated with that item. And so uh, that's what, uh, that's sort of a simple application of, of a content addressable memory. This, uh, this particular implementation, uh, I use this example because this is the one I've worried most about. Uh, you can use any, any sort of basic uh, logic element as the, as the memory element. In this case, I've used the standard two-phase shift register. And if you ignore these messy lines right here and here, what you, what you see is just the standard uh, two inverters, uh, phase one and phase two of the clock, and, and you can shift data along that way. Uh, I, and then, of course, ground and VDD and the, to power the inverters. There's uh, then to, to that, if you're going to do the, the content addressable function, you have to be able to bring in, in this case, data and data bar to each of the cells in the memory so that it has something to match against. And what you want to do is you want to compare uh, the data which, is, which is, exists on, on these two lines with what's actually stored in this bit and decide whether it represents a match or not. And since each of these cells has the capability to, to match, your whole memory is basically being searched simultaneously for that particular bit of, or set of bits of information 
that are on, the, on what I've called the data lines. Okay, in order to do the matching function, which is specified in, this, uh, in the equation below, uh, you want to, actually this is the, the not match function, uh, you want to, if the data and the, on, the, on these lines is uh, anded with the inverse of the data that's stored in the memory, uh, if either of those is, is uh, did I get that backwards? If you, pardon? It's the XOR function, that's right. You're just doing a, a matching, matching function. Data and data bar. You have to do. You have to match both ways in this scheme. You yeah, match one. Yeah, right. Right. The, one the, the, the one on the right should have been connected to. Data oh, I have it connected to the wrong place. Yeah. Um, MD should. Oh, this this. What's what's shown here should should actually come off this one up here. That's right. I've drawn that incorrectly. Oh well. Uh, yeah, I have I have two two matching two transistors coming off the data not line, and one of them should have been coming, coming off this line up here. Okay, the, the basic idea is that you're going to pre-charge this match line, and then what, what a word is represented by, by this bit and all the other bits which are in the vertical direction, and uh, if any one of those bits in the word does not match, then you want to pull the match line low. And only if the match line remains high after a certain length of time do you want to say that, that indeed there was a full match in that word. So what you do is you pre-charge the match line in this case, and then allow any one of those bits, in other words, this is another distributed OR function, to if any one of those bits pulls it down, then there's not a match. And to pull it down, all it says is that if, if the data not uh, anded in this AND function right here, uh, anded with the, with the memory data, is uh, if those do match, essentially if, if the inverse of the two match, then uh, you want to pull this low. And the, uh, and you have to do it for both sides to be able to sense both a 1 and a 0 in this fashion. <coughs> and uh, I guess, are there any questions about, about that particular function? Uh, this one does not show recirculation and, in fact, is, is a pure dynamic structure. Uh, you can add another control line. It's a, it gets to be a messy enough layout as it is, and if you can avoid having to have the uh, having to have a semi-static structure, uh, the necessity to put in a, a pass transistor which goes all the way around here uh, is, you know, messes things up a bit. So in this particular case, it was designed as purely a dynamic structure, and you have to shift it every once in a while to make sure the data stays, stays valid. I think that's uh, all I really wanted to say. We have a chance to finish early. Uh, I, I, do, I do want to discuss the homework a little bit, but are there any questions on, I guess either, since we have some time, we should talk about any questions on, on either of the day's uh, lectures, uh, either of Dick or myself, or about what we'll be doing in the future or uh, anything like that. Bob? I don't think I want to do pre-charging on my design, right? <laughs> uh, for, for initial designs, it's certainly something to avoid, yeah. You, it's, it starts getting into the point where you have to worry about the circuit characteristics of the, of the structure and capacitances and so forth. And uh, you can certainly do your designs in a sort of a non-circuit oriented fashion and just don't use all those tricks to uh, sort of get the last bit of speed and, and reduce the power consumption. So that's a, a, good, a good, very good point. How much speed improvement do you get? I, I can't give you any quanti quantitative numbers other than to say that, uh, for example, we saw the pull up, uh, the pull up out of a, a standard inverter is four times as slow as, as a pull down. And so uh, you might, you might uh, in the overall structure, I don't know, you might, you might gain a factor of two. Yeah, it, it, it can be significant. It's a very common technique, and uh, both for, for speed and power considerations.
one of the problems in building large chips is indeed the overall power consumption of the, of the system. And uh, just not so much that you can't generate enough power, it's getting rid of the power, getting rid of that, the heat off the chip. And so uh, people are often driven to using such techniques to get the power down to absolutely as little as possible. And it obviously affects the overall cost of the system in which you include it if you can get the, get the power down significantly. Questions? Any other questions? Okay. Uh, the homework was passed out at the beginning of the class. And today we want to concentrate on, on uh, clock structures. Not only do we want to do the designs and, and understand what clock structures mean, I actually, uh, even if you consider the designs easy or whatever, please do a sort of a reasonable size stick diagram of something so that you'll have something to use in the layout exercises which we're going to be getting into tomorrow. The, uh, it, you'll, it'll be difficult enough probably learning uh, the layout system or doing layout, following the layout rules and so forth without having to worry about designing a circuit at the same time. And so for your initial try, uh, I'd suggest that you prepare something that's complete enough that uh, you can use it in, in the following night's assignments. And I've suggested a couple of, of projects here or a couple of problems. And uh, if you feel these are trivial or irrelevant, please feel free to invent your own. And uh, I'd like to hear them or talk to you about them or whatever. Uh, if you'd like to discuss them, please come by. The, uh, the first problem is <clears throat> sort of points up the, a basic problem you'll come up to is, well, we, you, you often want a counter function, but that doesn't necessarily mean you want a counter as such or in the, in the strict sense of the word. And so I merely ask you to look at the alternate ways of, of implementing a counter function, and you can decide whether, uh, by looking at some alternate schemes, whether a PLA or some other regular structure like that makes more sense than a, than a random logic structure or one with specific uh, individual storage elements which you toggle every once in a while with propagations of carries and, and all that sort of thing. Uh, there, there is a place for such a structures and I'm sure you can find some applications where they're justified and uh, but I would like you to look at, at the two alternatives anyway and, and just get a, a feeling for the trade-off involved with those and as part of that look at what would what is required if you not if you don't want to build a 4-bit counter which is the one that's asked for but rather for example a, an 8 or 12 or 16-bit counter you know how does your design scale and so uh, basically it's a it's a it's a thought and, and exercise problem and hopefully you'll do some stick diagrams to uh, implement a couple of your solutions uh, just to, to get you thinking about the, the trade-offs and when you would do things one way and when you would do things another way. Leo? Uh, how do you want the output of a counter? In what form? Uh, let's say I just want the, uh, let's say I want a countdown chain. Well, now let's say I want all four, let's say I want all four output bi bits and I just want them, you know, four parallel output bits. I don't care whether they're true or complement. <laughs> Will? Uh, in the, the PLAs, you use the depletion mode to get um, green lines across red lines without using a forming a transistor. Uh, I haven't seen that done anywhere else in random logic. Is there a reason? Well, we, it, it's used in the logic blocks, not in the PLAs. Logic blocks, whatever. Yeah. Why, not, why not use that in other tricks, other <coughs> times when you want to get the two lines to cross? Uh, you can do that, but there every t it is another transistor that you have to go through. And so if it's a pass transistor array, for example, you know, that's another delay element. And uh, that just has to be considered. And sometimes the, uh, perhaps the layout geometry will, the gain in flexibility of layout geometries will be enough to justify it. Uh, alternatively, maybe going up, to, going up to metal and routing that signal across on metal, for example, will give you, you know, gives you faster speed and maybe it, it complicates the topology, however. And so you have to make that trade-off for in the particular application that you're worried about, depending on whether you're looking for size or speed or both or whatever. So you have to look at it in individual cases. It's also an extra fan out on the red line. Yeah, if you have to drive, if, if you've you got a thing driving that, then that's an extra fan out, right. Okay, the second, uh, second example is a, perhaps a little more complicated, but a little more straightforward. A little more stuff, but perhaps more straightforward. Uh, you're asked to implement 
basically uh, it's a set of registers, and we've talked a lot about registers, so that shouldn't be any problem, but it'll at least give you an opportunity to look at that and uh, make sure that you understand how they work. And also the ability to do matching between bits of a, bits of a couple of parallel registers and uh, experiment with some of the ideas, for example, that were done in the content addressable memory and masking, masking particular bits that you want to look at and not want to look at. And so it'll just give you, it'll give you an exercise looking at registers and manipulating some control lines and so forth to make sure that you understand the material that we've been covering today. Comment on that one. Yeah. The, the mask and the key registers have to have the ability to not shift. Just holds their data still. That's right. You want to be able to shift some data into the key register or the mask register. Now that perhaps isn't plain, and and hold it there, and then be able to shift data through the data register and compare it with this fixed key masked by whatever data is in the mask register. We provide for getting information into the mask register. Yeah, that would be. When we design this chip, can we uh, decipher the MBS encryption algorithm with it? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Why not? Um, I want to encourage any and all of you to drop by the SSL conference room, 2037, I believe it is, downstairs. Uh, we had a fair number of visitors yesterday, but we'd like to see more of you. And if you have any questions on uh, whether you have whether the, your particular solutions are correct or not correct, uh, Please come by and just talk about that or any other topic that you wish to uh, discuss. Any other comments? We go. I guess that's it. Oh, is there any reading for tomorrow? The reading is on the original outline. I'm sorry, I didn't put it on here. Uh, if you don't have the original outline still with you.